Uh, the first of the last speakers is the one and only, <laughs> the great Vadim Gladyshev. Thanks, Morten. Uh, and Alex and Morten, Daniela is amazing conference as usual. Thank you very much. Um, I will tell you a little bit today about uh, uh, aging and rejuvenation. And uh, in my lab, we uh, developed a program, a research program on, uh, on quantifying kind of longevity, aging, and rejuvenation in order to identify interventions against aging. And first, the way we do it, we <clears throat> develop, uh, we try to understand the basis of longevity. Uh, we identify states with the potential to live long. It's not age of the changes, but kind of changes that indi uh, in indicative of the potentially long life. And this is based on longevity across cell types, across mammals. We characterize about 40 species of mammals, multiple organs, and so also uh, uh, signatures of kind of known longevity interventions, which help us to identify new. We develop these signatures of longevity. Uh, in parallel, we work on age-related changes. Here, we develop biomarkers, such as epigenetic clocks, uh, transcriptomic clock. Alex Tushkovsky just uh, earlier today presented uh, this work, as well as other biomarkers. This leads to actionable biomarkers of aging, uh, which we apply. Uh, and the third component of this is we focus on rejuvenation, uh, because the transition from the young to old and from, to, from old to young is not necessarily the same transition. So we also need to understand those transitions. And this results in the, in the approaches that where we target aging and rejuvenation and identify interventions, compounds, and then we test them uh, in various ways against diseases, lifespan, uh, and so on. So uh, since I presented last year, I will, I will tell you uh, a few stories which uh, we have uh, kind of completed or published uh, since, uh, since last year. And the first one is uh, this paper uh, which uh, was done by Alex Trapp, sitting here. Uh, and uh, he uh, developed uh, this amazing work, uh, um, amazing uh, platform uh, for predicting biological age at a single cell level, uh, and this is done at uh, epigenetic level, uh, DNA methylation. Just an example of how it works. Uh, so here we trained uh, uh, clocks for the, for the liver as well as multi-tissue clock, and each dot here is a cell. Uh, you can see that on the left, mouse embryonic fibroblasts, see the age is predicted of each cell, approximately zero, as it should be. And then there's a four-month-old uh, mouse, hepatocytes from that mouse, uh, also prediction is pretty good. Uh, there's one cell is kind of uh, deviates from the expected, we think it's a senescent cell. And then also hepatocytes, um, and the old mouse also quite well pre predicted. So our model, the way we think about aging, is that uh, various cells, they kind of transition in the tissue uh, uh, during aging to an older state, but there's some heterogeneity with some cells aging a little bit faster and some uh, cells uh, a little bit slower. So in the end, uh, uh, when we uh, look at the tissue, it's, it's really uh, quite heterogeneic in terms of the aging patterns, aging of individual cells. Then uh, we um, uh, addressed another question. So here we studied this organism named Mole Red, and it was um, proposed that this organism does not age because um, uh, it, its mortality does not increase with age. So, um, so the question, of course, does it age or not? So we developed a, a clock uh, for the blood of the Nick Mole Red. Uh, you could see it here, and uh, apparently it does age. So we could develop plug and we could quantify the, the aging patterns. In fact, uh, we could uh, also uh, compare the aging rates of the Nick Red to other uh, mammals, here uh, mice and rats. So for example, in uh, panel D, uh, I, I have a pointer, but probably will not show a pointer because people uh, on, through the video will not be able to see. Uh, uh, like in panel D, uh, you can see the orange, um, it's mouse kind of decreasing size, in blue it's a Nick Red, and in green it's a human. Uh, and in E, it's like on a relative age. We put them on the same scale from zero to one. You can see that it's basically the, the old age. And they more red ages uh, faster than human, but slower than the mouse. So next, uh, we um, attempted to target aging already during development. Linda Partridge earlier at this conference presented work where they targeted um, mice uh, early in adulthood with rapamycin. But what we've done, we target them during development, basically for the first 45 days of life. 
and then we did nothing. Uh, here we followed uh, the mice. Uh, we could see that in panel B that the mice were smaller, and in panel C and D you can see that um, rapamycin treated mice they remained smaller even when we stopped uh, stopped uh, treating them with rapamycin. They never they never caught uh, control mice. So what we found that actually this treatment only during development extended the lifespan of these mice. It worked uh, best in, in males. Uh, it was a significant, significant effect. And I would say that uh, uh, we have this paper in Science Advances, which is coming out uh, this month. Uh, but then there's another study from the uh, lab of uh, Luca Tiberi. And they also independently uh, found the same. And they also treated mice during early development. Uh, they also live longer. So we also um, teamed up with uh, Leon Peshkin at Harvard Medical School. and. Uh, studied the strategy in Daphnia. It's a small uh, invertebrate uh, organism, a really good model for studying aging. We tried different concentrations of rapamycin treated only during development. And, and each time uh, we, uh, there was a, we observed lifespan extension. So apparently this is really conserved across species. So next uh, we uh, also studied uh, rejuvenation. Uh, and I will show you a few examples of, of rejuvenation. The first example is uh, parabiosis. This is a uh, work which was done by Bohan Zeng. He's a graduate student in the lab who recently uh, already defended his thesis. And it's a collaboration with uh, Jim White at Duke. So we um, attach mice for three months, old and young mouse. And then we uh, separate them and follow what happens. And for example, me measure two months later uh, various parameters, but also following for the entire lifespan. And what we found is that if we um, attach them for three months and then separate the mice, which are um, old mice, uh, formally attached to the young mice, they live longer. Their lifespan is extended significantly. Also, when we apply epigenic clocks, so on this slide, uh, you can see RRBS-based clocks, but we also have done uh, array-based clocks with uh, Steve Horvath. Uh, it's all the same, as well as the transcriptomic clock. They all, they all show, show very significant rejuvenation effect. So it's very clear that mice are rejuvenated in response to parabiosis. And then eventually they live longer, although it seems like this effect diminishes over time a little bit. So this is RNA-seq analysis that Alex Tushkovsky has done. And we can see that upon parabiosis, the mice look younger, also based on changes in gene expression. And also, uh, changes in gene expression resemble changes in response to other longevity interventions quantified by these longevity signatures, like calorie restriction, growth hormone deficiency, and so on. So there's another study uh, we've done, um, currently under review, where we uh, tested the effect of severe stress on biological age, quantified by epigenetic clocks. And here we uh, had a few examples. One is major surgery. For example, when there's an emergency uh, hip fracture and then uh, uh, results kind of in the hospitalization, it in increases uh, biological age, quantified by epigenetic clocks, and then there's a recovery period, it's all significant. The same way we observed in COVID-19, when uh, it's not infection itself, it's only when uh, patients go to the basically um, hospitalized and then uh, uh, placed on ventilator. This is the, the, the worst kind of situation. And the, their biological age, predicted biological age increases, but then once they recover, uh, the biological age is also reduced. And the same way we observe also for pregnancy, as well as parabiosis, when we look at the old at the young mouse. So when young and old attached, apparently um, uh, the age of the young mouse is transiently uh, increased. But two months later, actually, it recovers almost to the uh, normal level. So next, uh, we, um, uh, last year, uh, identified a new uh, process of rejuvenation uh, during embryogenesis. We found that the age of the zygote is not zero. It's, it's low, but a little bit above zero. And then uh, during early embryogenesis, um, the predicted biological age decreases. And we call this kind of minimal uh, age is uh, as ground zero. And then we think that's when aging begins, actually, in the organisms. Of course, I mean, it's, uh, it was only based on, at that point, on bulk epigenetic clocks. And also in one lab, of course, it needs to be verified. And, and we're still lo looking for, for other labs kind of test these ideas. Uh, 
Yeah. So, but meanwhile, what we've done, we applied uh, Alex Trapp's um, uh, single cell clock, and we observed that we also can quantify this rejuvenation effect. The, and this clock is completely different from the kind of uh, classical Horowitz clock. Uh, so, we, here at the data at a single cell level, we observe this embryonic day 4.5, 5.5, 6.5, 7.5. .5. We observe a reduction in biological age. So, but in, interestingly, it corresponds uh, to the increased methylation. So apparently, in order to rejuvenate, uh, it seems like um, the first the genome should be demethylated and remethylated, and really re remethylated state corresponds to the uh, lowest biological age. We also tested uh, whether we could um, observe this at the level of uh, different lineages during embryogenesis. We found that, for example, in the epiblast, from 4.5 to 7.5 days, as well as we observed this in, in the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. But interestingly, the extra embryonic tissues were not rejuvenated based on, the, on this epigenetic clock. So it's uh, in not, not, uh, not the entire embryo um, is rejuvenated, apparently. Again, this is uh, uh, only done in one lab. Of course, it needs to be further verified, but it, I think, provides some interesting insights. So, and then we decided also to test these ideas in the, in the frog, Xenopus uh, levis. And the reason is that um, in, in this species, of, uh, eggs are quite large. We could follow thousands of eggs and quantify and really do time resolved kind of analysis. So, but the problem was that there was no uh, opportunity clock, so we had to develop it. And this is a work uh, done by Bohan Zeng, Andrei Tarhov, and also collaboration with Leon Peshkin. So this is the clock um, for the uh, Xenopus skin, frog skin. So apparently we could develop this clock. And when we apply this to uh, during embryogenesis, the early embryogenesis, we again observe a reduction early in embryonic development. So initially predicted age is high, and then it kind of decreases. Uh, this is also quantification at the level of DNA methylation entropy. It shows a similar pattern. Now, uh, we uh, also wanted to test this idea that um, this uh, stage where we observe the minimal age uh, also is kind of the most important uh, period of life. And therefore, we, we're thinking that perhaps this would be uh, the most sensitive uh, period and that might correspond to the highest uh, mortality. So what we did, we developed a screen approach for, um, uh, for this frog development um, to test mortality. And we followed over 6,000 embryos this way. Of, of, of frogs, and uh, the one uh, kind of embryo circled with red shows the, the example when the embryo does not develop. So we actually observed a very low mortality in frogs, only at a level of about 2%. And interestingly, when uh, we um, uh, looked where exactly the, uh, the embryos die, they exactly cor correspond to this um, gastrulation stage. Here on this scale, zero corresponds to the onset of gastrulation. And you can see in, in, in different colors, different kind of trial uh, trials we have done, and uh, it's, it's very clear that mortality is highest at this period. So when we now plot together DNA methylation entropy, uh, the DNA methylation total DNA methylation level, as well as DNA methylation age, they all kind of correspond to this transition. So uh, once uh, Lewis Wolpert, uh, famous evolutionary biologist, so he, a development biologist, he said that it's not birth, marriage, or death, but gastrulation, which is truly the most important time in your life. And apparently, this period is also important for aging and rejuvenation. So that's it. So this is a summary of what I presented today. So I've, I told you a little bit about the clocks, a bulk clock, single cell clock, necmo red clock, and frog clock. I also told you about targeting aging during development. Uh, we found that rapamycin during development extends the lifespan of mice and Daphnia. Um, we also studied aging in the absence of increased mortality in the necmo rat, and we found that these species, they age, epigenetically age, but actually we think uh, they, they do age. I should say that um, Vera Grubunova and, and Steve, they, uh, they also published a separate paper and with basically similar findings. Um, we also found these reversal changes in biological age, um, predicted biological age as quantified by the clocks, uh, in the case of m m severe stress. 
like um, severe COVID-19 symptoms of major surgery, pregnancy, and parabiosis, and each time we observe a recovery. And finally, I told you a little bit about rejuvenation, where we found that chronic parabiosis rejuvenates old mice and extends li their lifespan. Uh, we found that um, uh, we observe low histopogenetic age around gastrulation in both uh, mammals and mice, basically, in frogs. And on, also, also that gastrulation, gastrulation corresponds to the highest mortality. So we actually don't know um, the patterns of mortality in mammals uh, during early development. And we, for example, don't know what, when exactly embryos die, like for example in humans, uh, because there's a black box between like 14 days and, and maybe 45 days. Uh, but would be interesting to test and also would be, would be interesting to test in, in mice. Um, so we think that aging actually begins at gastrulation and runs in parallel with development. That aging is not a continuation of development, but there are two processes. That aging is basically a generation of damage and damage is, is generated during development. Development is a program. We need genes for development, but we don't need genes for aging. Yeah. And I think this understanding also allows us to study rejuvenation because we think that these two, pro two processes may be uncoupled in both directions, in the direction of aging and also in direction of rejuvenation when, for example, partial reprogramming could potentially uh, rejuvenate at the level of uh, biological age while preserving cell identity. And, and finally, uh, this also indicates that th there's a maybe, still maybe, still need to be proven further, that there's a process of earlier uh, rejuvenation during early development. If, if we identify mechanisms of this process, perhaps, you know, we don't know yet if they can be implied in, uh, applied in the adult state, but hopefully they may be applied. This would be really cool. So that's it. This is the, um, uh, my lab, currently lab, and I mostly presented the work from Bohan Zeng, Alex Tyshkovsky, Andrei Tarhov, and Jesse Poganik. Uh, and also the previous lab members, Alex Trapp, uh, Anastasia Shindyapina, and Saba Kiripeshi. Thank you very much. This is uh, always so incredibly fascinating. Um, there's questions. Uh, I think those two gentlemen were first and then you after. Hi, um, very nice talk. I don't know if you mentioned this, but in the graph where you show the recovery after um, the increase of uh, biological age uh, due to things like parabiosis or surgery, uh, I'm not sure if it was uh, significant, but it didn't seem like a full recovery. So my question would be, do you believe that uh, processes then like uh, pregnancy or uh, surgery, if done one or the other, you will be creating more damage, which you cannot fully re uh, reverse, uh, maybe partially, but not fully. Yeah. I think it would depend on the model. In some cases, there could be a pro probably a full recovery, uh, and sometimes might not be. Uh, we don't really know. And in fact, we don't know whether we can call this process rejuvenation or just kind of uh, recovery from stress. This is still kind of uh, an unknown, um, uh, 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 still unknown basically. But this is clearly observed by multiple clocks. I, I should comment that it's best observed by the second generation clocks like Fino Age and Grim Age. Great talk. So mm -hmm. my question is along no. the same line. If in your parabiosis experiment you have parabiosis for three months, some uh, uh, results in the life extension, right? If, do you know exactly like how, mu how many months you have to do this to see an extension? And can you just do plasma transfusion for a couple of days to see similar results? Uh, we only have done it for one month and three months uh, probiosis. And we observed that the effect of at one month, is, the effect is much weaker. So we really, the longer kind of time of when mice are attached gives a stronger rejuvenation effect. But Oh, why is that? Mechanistically, I don't think it's very clear in the field because there are various uh, competing ideas. One idea, for example, cells in the blood. Another possibility is a plasma. A third possibility is the access to the younger organs. And perhaps various components uh, of, of these factors, they contribute to the overall effect. Uh, so to me, like single injection, for example, of, of plasma, uh, I, I don't know. I'm, 
I'm doubtful that actually it would, it would really work in, in this case because the effect would be quite weak or maybe it would be transient, I'm not sure. So we would need really, a, because we tested many kind of models of rejuvenation and actually it's not easy to rejuvenate organism. And in the case of probiosis, I guess it's the, maybe the strongest effect we observe in, of all of the models. But in many other cases, just it's not easy to do it. All right, I, I have a question about it. I, I still feel, find this gastrulation finding really interesting and fits that the epiblast is where you want to rejuvenate, of course. What about uh, organisms where you don't have gastrulation? What about, what about yeast? Do the yeast daughter cells, are they rejuvenated? And could that be used as a screening platform for, you could do sing, single cell methylation, I guess, in, the, in that? Mm -hmm. Well, in yeast, I think there is a rejuvenation at the level of gamete formation. Mm. So gametes are kind of synthesized from within the cell. Right. And therefore, it's, this, it's basically new material, and therefore, it is rejuvenated right. as well. Yeah. Uh, if uh, they also can divide, of course, by budding, uh, and buds also, there's a barrier between the mother and daughter cells, and uh, mostly it's a new material which is synthesized in the new cell, and through this dilution, it leads to rejuvenation. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Madam. Mm -hmm.